I'm Hannah. Um, I lead AI innovation at Indeed, but the real reason that I'm here for this conversation is because back in the day, I was one of the original founders of Blue Ridge Labs. I mean, for those who don't know, yay, Blue Ridge. Um, if you're not familiar with the labs, um, Blue Ridge is Robinhood's venture studio. Uh, they work on helping to start and scale tech-driven innovations to support low-income households and all of the organizations that serve them. And Jimmy was one of the very first fellows in the first fellowship cohort of Blue Ridge Labs back in 2014. And so I'm really excited to be back together with him to talk a little bit about the company that he built coming out of that program, Propel. So, uh, Jimmy, maybe start us off with how you came to start Propel. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, and thank you, Hannah, and the rest of the Robinhood team for making Blue Ridge Labs and all of this possible. My story is one that is deeply intertwined with the decision 11 years ago now to start that program and to help founders like me who knew how to build things in technology but didn't know exactly what to build or how to think about that for low-income populations to start a new type of company. So my personal background, um, I grew up in a loving and supportive household uh, that came over to the United States from China when I was four, um, had a very happy childhood, but just one where we never had enough money. I went to college on a financial needs scholarship and I learned how to code. I got into the tech industry. I worked at places like LinkedIn and Facebook um, and was fortunate to experience the IPOs of both of those companies and just learned a lot from a lot of smart software people. But um, the thing that I always had in my head through my career in tech was that people in consumer tech especially build for the problems that they understand. And I think that works in certain categories. It creates companies that are incredible for ride sharing or finding a vacation home or things like that. Um, but I kept thinking about how the tech industry wasn't really doing a lot for people like my parents when I was growing up. And um, so you know, struggling with that kind of discomfort of the conventional wisdom in tech being built to solve your own problems and the feeling that tech was really doing a great job of building tools for the wealthy, but not a fantastic job of thinking about people who were underrepresented in the tech industry and exactly what tools they needed, especially in an era where really most people have access to smartphones and the internet, but it's the software on those phones. It's the things that people can actually do on those phones that was making a huge difference in whether that technology was useful to them. So um, that resulted in me... Uh, leaving Facebook in 2014, moving out to Brooklyn like three weeks after having a first call with Hannah for the first cohort of the Blue Ridge Labs program. Yeah. Uh, yes, which uh, which was a big risk on your part because at that point we had literally no idea what we were doing. But um, tell me a bit about the product that you have ended up building and its current scale because I think this is really exciting and impressive. So um, I will talk about the Propel product and then I want to actually loop back a little bit to the Blue Ridge Lab story again. So uh, Propel builds an app that helps people who get SNAP benefits, more commonly known as food stamps, to see their balance and improve their financial health. Our app is used by more than 5 million people throughout the country each month. There are about 21 million households in the U.S. that get SNAP benefits. So about one in four Americans who get SNAP is a monthly active user of the Propel app today. It exists because uh, in the Blue Ridge Labs program, one of the core tenants is to start by talking to the community, right? It's this, you know, if you think about the problem that I teed up earlier, that people in tech solve the problems that they understand, how do you address that? How do you help techies understand a different set of problems? It's not really like a magic, you know, silver bullet to it. It really is as simple as talk to people that are experiencing poverty, really listen to them, look for things that you could actually do to improve their their kind of day-to-day uh, -day experiences. And, and so that was kind of the playbook by which we founded Propel. Um, specifically, if you're one of the 40 million Americans who get SNAP benefits on the BT card, you probably call this 1-800 number on the back of the card to check your balance. And so back in 2015, when we launched the Propel app, it was the first mobile app in the United States that allowed someone with an EBT card to get access to essentially mobile banking, to be able to see your balance in transaction history the same way that someone with a debit card or credit card would be able to. Um, over the last 10 years now, a lot of our work has been realizing that that's the acquisition hook. That allows us to build a platform that allows us to serve these 5 million people every month. The average person who uses our app opens it 14 times per month. And so we've built this really engaging, sticky platform. But the helping people see their EBT balance is not the ends. That's actually just the way to get a trusted relationship with people so that we can help families who are experiencing food insecurity using the social safety net make it through each month. And that means helping people save money on food, helping them cross enroll in different programs, helping them manage their health care and find jobs and do banking and so on. So the Propel app has really expanded into a broader financial management tool that is built very specifically for Americans who use the, the uh, social safety net. Great. 
Um, and so Propel uh, is a for-profit company, which is not always what you see in sort of the, the public sector um, safety net space. Um, talk to us about how you make money and maybe also about like how you've held uh, finding a way to make money that's really consistent with the values that you all founded the company around. So one of the things I really loved about the Blue Ridge Labs program is that it was agnostic about what kind of venture we started, right? So it could have been a for-profit, could have been a non-profit. And in the decade and change since, actually a, a whole variety of different types of organizations have sprung up through that program. That program is actually still recruiting for its next class of fellows, by the way, in case you're interested or know someone who might be excited to be a fellow in the next class. Um, so I joined the program really wanting to start a for-profit company, but it was for kind of the theoretical reason that I thought building a business that earned revenue would be the most sustainable way to have an impact. That if you could build a business that earns money, but also creates a social impact in the same motion, that would be the strongest, most sustainable thing. Sounds nice in theory, hard in practice, obviously. Um, but again, going back to the Blue Ridge Labs playbook of start with the community, start by talking to people, that was sort of the approach that I took here. So um, Hannah probably uh, has even even funnier stories about me during the fellowship. But one of the things I spent a lot of time doing during, during the fellowship was going to the SNAP office in Brooklyn. There was one in Borum Hill that was like two or three blocks away from our office on Court Street in Cobble Hill. Um, and I was spending my time enrolling in SNAP benefits and trying to learn what it would be like to enroll in benefits myself. One of the things I didn't expect to see, but that I learned by going to the SNAP office every day, is that actually the sidewalk outside the SNAP office is really crowded. And it's, uh, it's people with folding tables. It's people who are trying to intercept people that are walking in and out of the SNAP office. And so eventually I, I went up to those folks and tried to find out what they were all about. What are they doing there with their folding tables? And I found that they were from cell phone companies. They were from employment agencies. They were from a variety of different companies that all had actually a financial incentive to reach people who are using SNAP benefits with a product that actually improved their financial health. And that the economics were so upside down that they were actually posting agents on the street to talk to people walking in and out of the SNAP office because there's no digital way to reach that population. And so, you know, in the early days, uh, I thought about Propel's business as a digital sidewalk, right? It's this idea of digitizing access so that people who get SNAP benefits get a whole host of other benefits that are added on to their SNAP by saying, hey, once you enroll in SNAP, here are 10 other things that uh, most of which are free or steeply discounted that allow you to improve your financial life. Those companies pay us for marketing, but that allows us to have some kind of social impact and business impact at the same time. Awesome. All right, so we're all here today because AI has this potential to really transform products and services. Um, Propel was obviously founded before the AI boom, but I know that you all are thinking about how to incorporate AI into your products, and I think that we would love to see what that looks like. Yeah, let's do it. Um, so I've got some demos that I'd love to show. Um, and uh, before I get into it, just want to give a shout out to uh, to the Gates Foundation, who has been the primary funder of most of this work at Propel. Um, and it's Clarence and Aras and the rest of the Gates team have really been fantastic champions and connectors for us as we've started to navigate this space. Um, so the example that I told earlier of how we got started, checking your EBT balance is like a pretty mundane, everyday problem. It's not the sexiest thing, doesn't get headlines. It's not what people necessarily think of from the outside when they think about using the safety net. But actually, as we've spent the last decade talking to SNAP participants, we've actually found that like the, the, the lived experience of the safety net is more mundane things than it is like big, exciting, fancy headline grabbing things. And so... Um, as we've been experimenting with AI and thinking about how it can make our product even stronger to meet the needs of our users, um, I wanted to share these three vignettes of real things that people who get SNAP benefits need to do and how we've used AI to prototype features that could make that feel more modern. Okay, so the first one. Um, you may have seen across the news uh, that there are a variety of states that have passed or are thinking about passing item restrictions for the SNAP program. The SNAP benefit that exists right now can be used for unprepared food at grocery stores. And there are, uh, there's kind of a broad national conversation about should that include things like soda and candy and so on. So uh, regardless of kind of the values judgment of whether or not that is the right policy, the reality is in a number of states that is about to be the policy sometime in 2026. And states are dealing with a whole variety of implementation challenges around how to make this work. And one of the ones that a few forward-leaning states are thinking about is how do we actually tell people who get SNAP benefits what items they can buy or not buy? 
And it, it may seem like an obvious thing, but actually when we've talked to our users, we found that it doesn't seem that obvious at all. Um, and that's because there are lots of items that are sort of questionably, does, does this count as soda? Does this count as candy? Does this count as chips? Those definitions are not so clear. So one of the things we've been prototyping is this very simple feature that allows you to go into a grocery store, open up the camera, look at an item, and see that this particular item is not eligible based on how the item restrictions and the kind of SKU codes are being aligned for that state. Um, you might continue your shopping trip and look at a different item, for example, this uh, seltzer over here, and find that it is eligible for SNAP benefits because it does not count as a sugar-sweetened uh, item. So again, might feel kind of mundane, but it's the kind of thing that prevents someone from getting through the, the whole checkout line and having this embarrassing experience of, I can't pay for that with my SNAP, uh, using SNAP benefits. Okay, um, vignette number two is something that is unfortunately too common in the SNAP program, and that is that somebody unexpectedly does not get a deposit. So you may know SNAP gives you a deposit once every month on a regular schedule, but something like one in five of our Propel users across the country actually misses a deposit unexpectedly at some point over a calendar year. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why that might be the case, but legally the state must send you what's called a notice of action letter when your SNAP benefits change and stop. And so here's a feature that we prototyped that uses AI to try to improve that experience. You would get a push notification that says, hey, your deposits haven't arrived, but we can help. And when you tap that, we would help you give a little bit of context about what's going on and help you identify your change of action letter. Sorry, a notice of action letter. This is a real copy of a notice of action letter that uh, one of our users who lives in the state of Florida sent us. You can take a photo of that letter and using a model that we've also fine-tuned using a variety of other types of, 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 of policy inputs that are specific to that state, looking at things like state casework and, uh, manuals, we're able to help someone interpret what this notice says and give them a clear call to action. In this particular case, the cardholder needs to submit bank statements urgently in order to get their SNAP benefits back. Okay, um, and I want to jump right into the third vignette, and final one, which is what happens after that. So you may have noticed the first two stories were really about read access. So it's about someone, it's about telling somebody about something that's going on in their case or about the program. The third example is uh, both trickier and I think higher upside in that it's a right action. It's the ability to send something into the state and actually change the system using AI as a tool. So uh, we're still on that same example. We've got a cardholder who unexpectedly uh, is missing their SNAP benefits, got this confusing letter. We help them understand what the letter says. Next, they need to submit their bank statements. So here's what, it, what agentic AI, a kind of crazy buzzword these days, might look like applied to the safety net, is that we can actually help somebody identify what they need to do and help them to take the action to go do it. In this particular case, they are uploading their bank statements by connecting through Plaid to get their bank statements. And then we have built this kind of subsequent portion that is helping them log in to the state portal. This is a person who lives in the state of California, is helping them pass through two-factor authentication and is actually submitting these documents to their case on their behalf. So if these examples like seem a little bit mundane, that's kind of the point, right? That these are things that I think are very much the expectation for how programs ought to work if you are used to private sector programs. But for people who navigate the safety net every, uh, each and every day, I think these actually would feel like a meaningful step forward in the usability and how modern these programs feel. Great. Thank you for that. Um, so I, I have a follow-up question on this, which is that, you know, there's this sort of open secret in the tech community that um, generative AI is like really great for making splashy demos, um, but it doesn't always lead to consistent, reliable products. And I'm curious, since you're working with such a vulnerable population, how are you thinking about the risks of hallucination and non-deterministic models and really making sure that that quality of experience has always been there is still there for your users? Yeah, it's such an important question. And it's one that I think we take a lot of ownership in working in this space. I think it's kind of a default based expectation that if you're in the space working with these kind of, of new technologies that you'd be thoughtful about it. Um, so as a starting point, we haven't actually shipped any of those features that I showed to our full user base of 5 million people across the country. Uh, we sort of see it as like three phases for any major feature like this that we want to ship. The first is really small scale testing with a human in the loop 
usually with something like 10 or 20 people that are using the feature, where we can text the individual and get their feedback on how it's working. We can review each of the documents. We can look very specifically line by line. Did this person have the interaction we were expecting or not? Once we pass that, we would move into the next phase, which is usually a few thousand people that are using the feature at any given point in time. That's really important because for many of these features, the things that we would catch or the, or, or the things that would make it not ready to ship are in the edge cases. And that might only show up once you've reached the scale of thousands of people. And so that's a key step for a lot of these features as well. And then only after we pass that, do we feel comfortable scaling these things up to our full user base of 5 million people? Um, I think for us, the 5 million users is both our biggest advantage in the space in that we are already serving a quarter of Americans who use the EBT card. And so to have a new feature like this, we could scale up uh, quite quickly, but I think also something that gives us a lot of pause around how we can scale responsibly. Um, you know, the other thing that I'll add uh, as we think about this that I, for us is really important philosophically is that I think it's important to compare the uh, error rates of AI-driven tools, not with 100%, but with what the status quo actually is. So in SNAP, the USDA publishes something that's called the caper rate, which refers to procedural errors and communication errors in SNAP. In the year 2023, that was 44%. So 44% of people who were either denied or had a change to their SNAP benefits, there was some kind of error when that happened. It could have been a communication error. It could have been not done in a timely fashion. Or for 17% of people, it was actually a wrong decision. These are people who might have lost SNAP benefits, um, you know, as a result of the existing system. So, um, you know, we, we are huge believers in the SNAP program overall, but I think we have to be clear that like the status quo is not excellent. The status quo is a lot of opportunity for improvement. And that's not to say that we should accelerate into a dystopic like AI driven future that's even worse. But I think there's a lot of opportunity to do better than we're currently doing. Great. Uh, one last question, because we're getting to the end of our time. Um, help us understand like what's the long term vision? Where do you want Propel to go in the future? And how does AI play into that? Yeah. Um, I think we are approaching a time in America where the social safety net is more important than it ever has been. And I think that is due to major macro changes. It's due to policy swings. It's due to potential disruption from AI itself. But I think we're getting to a point in the country where it is just so incredibly important that Americans can know that regardless of their financial circumstances, that they can put food on the table they can have shelter, they can have health care, these types of very basic things um, that are really the premise of the social safety net in, in, in this country. And I think um, a functioning safety net has really two components. It has funding, which is obviously the headline grabbing thing. It's in the headlines right now as we talk about what the new budget bill is going to be. But it's also the delivery of those benefits. And I think that doesn't get talked about quite enough, that the delivery of benefits is what makes the taxpayer dollars that go into the safety net actually have the impact that they're supposed to have on people. Uh, I think it also results in people who use the safety net feeling either respected and seen or, um, you know, feel like they're, you know, they're, uh, you know, feeling a sense of shame for what they have to, to use. And, and, and so I think the delivery of benefits is this really underappreciated but hugely impactful thing. And that's what Propel is really all about, a belief that improving the delivery of benefits actually has a positive feedback loop to the funding side, right? So much of the funding conversation these days is around adding work requirements and reducing fraud and all those things. And yes, I think generally people agree that benefits should go to their intended recipients and they should have their maximum uh, level of impact. And if we can improve the delivery side, I think it does actually radically change the political conversation around the the uh, the amount of benefits that people can receive. Um, and so Propel is doing this as a technology company. And I think that's the other really key part about who we are in our DNA um, is that we are first and foremost a technology company that plays with new technologies that tries to adapt what's what's working in the public or in the private sector at the biggest tech companies to the benefit of low income Americans who use the SNAP program that our team is largely people who you know similar to me have worked in other world class technology companies and are taking those insights on the design engineering and product side and trying to apply them to the daily lives of low income Americans and so the role that we want to play and what propel can be is kind of the entity that allows the delivery side of the safety net to feel modern to feel just as good as any other part of of the consumer experience of using the internet amazing all right and um, that is it for our time let's give a big round of applause for jimmy thank you so much <laughs>